Right. So I, I think when we're thinking about composability, we should ask ourselves what we're trying to achieve, like what is the outcome um, we're trying to arrive at. And I, I think the, the answer is we're trying to get towards a more service-oriented architecture where we can compose services very efficiently and securely. And this is, in fact, the direction in which standard kind of computing architecture has also gone, right? So you have monolithic architectures where you have some kind of closed systems that people can't compose with another system. And so all the work that goes into that system is kind of only for its own benefit and not something that can be reused by others. And then you have a microservices or a service-oriented architecture approach which allows people to make multiple independent services that then interact in secure and very useful ways. And this is really what I think we're, we're trying to achieve when we seek to create composability within DeFi. This is once again, a very common kind of dynamic that the larger computing landscape has gone towards, right? Before service oriented architectures, you had these big applications and they kind of lived within these database kind of mainframe things and they all interacted in some limited way and it was really tough to get them to work together. And you had more and more of a move towards service-oriented architectures, um, initially just by making different services, then microservices, then serverless approaches. And I think that that's really the same logical direction that the smart contract ecosystem and the architectures you see in the smart contract ecosystem will be going towards. And I think it makes a lot of sense because it improves about your assumptions around security by separating different concerns. You get reusability of the services. And so anybody putting effort into those services makes them useful for others. And the composition of those services allows rapid iteration in ways that you couldn't have in a more monolithic um, single application kind of structure, right? And the parallels within our space are slowly starting to emerge, right? Like when I look at the history of smart contracts, which albeit within this, the world of computing isn't a very long history, we already have examples of more monolithic smart contracts like the DAO, which were written um, in these big, big chunks that ended up not being secure because they were written in this monolithic big kind of format and many of which were not really usable or made to be usable by others, right? So you, you see a similar dynamic where you're going from and where you're going from a, an architecture around a single resource that's closed and that's possibly built in a very stacked kind of very complicated way where a lot of problems can hind to a dynamic where you have multiple smaller services that interact within one protocol, but then those separate services within that protocol can actually be used by other protocols. And this is the dynamic in which we fit into where we're providing data into those various protocols, into the various services within those protocols. And now you see these different DeFi protocols made by amazing teams like Synthetix and Aave and Yearn all being composed together into more and more advanced products and sharing value and sharing functionality. And that's what I really think DeFi composability is going to be achieving for all of us. And I, I can actually see it working, which is part of the reason things are moving so much faster. Because this is how things usually get built in the real world is you compose a bunch of services and build something great, right? Within the historical context, you really had one monolithic service in the sense that you had Bitcoin at the beginning. Then in 2014, you had blockchains, which were also kind of closed and only able to add smart contract functionality when you wrote it into the protocol, which took months. Then you had Ethereum smart contracts show up with a scriptable capability where people were kind of still able to do things around tokenization and DAOs, right? Those were pr primary the two use cases. And that's the composability that people got is they could compose dynamics around tokens and DAOs and how those interact. There's a lot of fascinating work that, that came out of that and tokens and a lot of value got into the ecosystem. So it's very positive. And now I think we're going towards a world where people are writing financial products and smart contracts that are more advanced, partly because they can interact with the outside world in a secure way through something like, like an Oracle network like Chainlink. You, you basically have people now being able to write smart contracts, not only about tokens and voting for DAOs, but also about financial products that depend on price data, insurance products that depend on weather data, gaming products that depend on randomness inputs. And all of these types of new, more advanced smart contracts need to interact with the outside world and its collection of services, right? And, and this interaction with the outside world opens up, in my opinion, and enables a new category of smart contracts in the form of DeFi. And it's, it's not really a, that much of a coincidence that as you have high quality oracles appear, you have DeFi smart contracts being built and composed into more and more markets, more and more use cases, right? And, and we're kind of just very proud of being able to even 
even participate and help enable great teams like Synthetic, Sanave, Nexus Mutual, BZX, like all these teams that are trying to build these next generation um, kind of systems, right? The, the way this is really done from, from our side, from the point of view of composability, is the provision of all these external systems into these services, right? So I see the DeFi protocols like Aave writing a lot of different services that many different people can put value into from various interfaces and use in very exciting ways. And then I see the need for inputs such as data to enable those services to function securely and offer new markets, offer new interactions with, uh, with the real world through price data a lot of the time. But in more and more cases actually through the provision of new collateral that's proven to be useful also through the help of oracles, right? And I, I think what you really see is you see us initially going into one or two categories, but now expanding into other categories where inputs that essentially act as on-chain services are used more and more. So the initial set of inputs that we focused on was providing price data, which is quite valuable for proving things about the market to financial products like Aave, like Synthetics, and enabling them to launch many new useful markets in a secure way. Our model enables data providers to sign their own data as, as a data provider and run their own chain link node. And we already have people doing that. And essentially this takes an existing data provider and enables them to create an on-chain representation of themselves as a service and to sign their own data at the origin, right? So that's something that some of the more advanced data providers in our ecosystem do and have been doing for, for well over a year now and signing data into the reference data networks, feeding things like Aave. Then our model is also flexible enough to allow inputs and services that don't want to run their own node. So you have a multitude of data providers that won't run their own node because the market isn't large enough or they don't have a need to do that at this moment. And they still have a lot of data that you want to provide to the blockchain and DeFi ecosystem. And this is where the Chainlink network allows us to provide services both in a signed format where the data provider runs their own node in less than a day and in the format where data providers basically just sell their data into the Chainlink network without having to change anything about their infrastructure. We also see other categories of services that we enable or off-chain data that we basically turn into on-chain services that contracts can consume through things like weather data. So our ability to provide rainfall and temperature and various weather data has already enabled things like Arbol, which is crop insurance, smart contract crop insurance and geographies where they tr wouldn't traditionally have crop insurance. And so that's another example of a service being put on chain with the help of uh, chain link nodes being run by data sources or chain link nodes consuming data without data providers making changes to infrastructure and the provision of that service then being composed with another set of contracts to make smart contract insurance. Likewise, with our ability to provide randomness, uh, we've already seen a number of gaming uh, teams adopt Chainlink VRF as another input that they find to be highly reliable and useful in their ability to rely on an external randomness system that provides assurance to their users. And so now you see the composability of randomness into blockchain gaming, in addition to price data, in addition to weather data. Recently, we also released something called proof of reserve, where you basically have an Oracle network proving the status of collateral, which makes that collateral reliable and therefore useful to DeFi and enabling its use more and more in various protocols. And what I, what I think all of this uh, essentially arrives at is that service-oriented architecture becoming more and more prevalent, more and more composable, more and more easy for development teams like Yearn, like Aave, to both add new components to in the form of DeFi protocol contracts and for others to then feed value into those DeFi protocol contracts which are supported by additional services like price feeds and randomness and you know, weather data for insurance products that then become collateral. And so I kind of see a future where both the composability from the DeFi projects making new additional services in the form of smart contracts that do various things with financial products, generate various financial products, various gaming products that then might also generate collateral for DeFi and services um, put on chain through systems like Chainlink, where you have signed data provided on chain by people running their own Chainlink nodes. You have the Chainlink network purchasing data from various data sources that don't want to change their infrastructure and providing it very efficiently uh, to the DeFi ecosystem and the insurance ecosystem, the gaming ecosystem, so that those ecosystems can have all the kind of building blocks, the different services that they need to compose in order to make their use case work. 
And I think the faster we can do all that and the more different composable pieces there are, the, the more that our industry and our space begins to look like the web industry and we begin to build at web speeds. I think the, the real challenge is how do you build these composable building blocks, but how do you also do it in a, in a secure way that abstract security concerns away from the people that are then composing those building blocks together in secure ways. And so you, you want speed from the point of view of developers building things. And you also wanna provide them with a system that guarantees certain levels of security while they're speedily composing these various building blocks together. Awesome. Uh, Sergey, we're gonna start moving on to Stanny, um, but we'll give you a second to wrap up if that's okay. Sure, sure, glad, glad to wrap up. Um, this is, uh, this is the, the kind of problem we're working on. We actually see a cyclical nature to this problem where as more smart contracts appear, you have more usage of these services and this data and all of these, even these DeFi protocols. And that encourages more data and more services to be placed on chain, which is one of the dynamics that we're kind of intimately involved in and driving forward is you see a circle, circular pattern between there's a market for data, I'm gonna put more data on chain and therefore that's gonna enable more um, DeFi markets, DeFi smart contracts, and subsequently even more DeFi services that can be composed into more DeFi things, right? So that's, that's one cyclical pattern. Another pattern is that people tend to pay for security. And so as the user fees from these smart contracts begin to grow and grow and grow, they get fed into a system like Chainlink where those user fees are paid, are using to pay for more data, more security, and you, you kind of arrive at a place where the two cyclical patterns between more smart contracts, generating more usage of data, making more demand for data, and then systems like Chainlink enabling the provision of that data in a you know, signed format from the origin or by purchasing the data directly from data sources that don't want to sign their own data yet. You, you basically see systems like Chainlink accelerating these two cycles. And in accelerating these two cycles, the ecosystem gets more services to compose into DeFi smart contracts, both in the, in the, the variety of data and in the quality of data, as well as the security with which that data is secured. If, if people are interested you know, in this idea and this seems like a worthwhile body of work, we have two ways they can work with us and get involved. The, the first one is the grant program. We have a very active grant program where people can come and work with us from the various blockchain ecosystems where we integrate data into and from data providers that are getting integrated into Chainlink and the various developer tooling that people need to use these composable services. Uh, and so we have a very active grant program that both cons that consultancies, individual developers, and, and even certain teams uh, are already involved in and, and using. So if you want to help accelerate these two cycles, we have a very active grant program that's really working, now working with some of the best and leading teams and it's growing and growing and kind of helping accelerate this cycle. And the second way that we're, we're thrilled to work with people interested in this problem is directly on, uh, on one of the teams building Chainlinks. One of them is uh, Chainlink Labs. And you know, we have a number of positions open. We're rapidly uh, growing the team to meet demand because the rate at which DeFi is growing and blockchain gaming is kind of growing and our positioning on multiple chains and the growth we're seeing there all um, requires really smart people to solve some of the really difficult research problems and the technical implementation problems and the problems in actually dealing with users. So if, uh, if this is a worthwhile body of work and you think it's interesting, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be thrilled to speak with you.